To say that the Battle of the Catalanian Plains is iconic would be an understatement. But it is equally controversial. As the sources describing the battle are conflicted, many details are unknown, and it seems that we will never get a clear picture of the events. Add to that two larger-than-life figures in Attila and Aetius, the Great Migration, the agony of the Roman world, and the birth of new kingdoms, and it is clear that we had no other choice but to cover it. We know very little about the Huns before their arrival to the Eurasian steppes in the second half of the 4th century. In the 370s they defeated the Alans and Goths, who lived to the north of the Black Sea, and this probably caused a cascade of events known as the Great Migration, as many tribes were forced to flee to the west and enter the territory of the Roman Empire, either as allied federati or invaders. Roman army was crushed at Adrianople by the western branch of the Goths, the Visigoths, in 378, while the Vandals and Suebi first entered Gaul and then occupied part of Spain. In 410, the Visigoths under Alaric sacked Rome. The Visigoths were then allowed to form a kingdom in southern France with a capital in Toulouse in exchange for military service against the Vandals and Suebi. Meanwhile, the Huns subjugated the Gepids, Alemanni, the Eastern Goths, Ostrogoths, and other minor Germanic, Slavic, and Sarmatian tribes. Between 395 and 399, they attacked both the Eastern Roman and the Sassanid empires, raiding the Balkans, the Caucasus, Northern Iran, and Eastern Anatolia. As the Hunnic realm was extremely decentralized, Many of their warriors served as mercenaries both for the Western Romans and the Goths. Still, the raids into the Eastern Roman Empire continued, and the empire was forced to pay annual tribute in 422. The Western Empire was also having problems, as civil wars, rebellions, and further invasions weakened it. Enter Flavius Aetius. This Roman general, either of Gothic or Scythian origin, spent his childhood as a hostage in the Visigothic and Hunnic courts, learning much about their fighting styles and gaining valuable allies among the Huns. In 423, it allowed him to recruit a sizable Hunnic force and move to Italy to support Joannes to the throne. However, by the time Aetius reached the capital, Ravenna, another pretender, Valentinian, was crowned. To curb his ambitions, Aetius was paid a hefty sum and was appointed the commander in Gaul. Despite some setbacks, he managed to restore Roman rule to most of Gaul, relying heavily on the Hun mercenaries. He settled the Alans around Orléans to weaken the rebellion in Brittany, destroyed the Burgundian kingdom and resettled it to the south, and weakened the Visigoths and Franks, basically creating his own semi-independent kingdom in the region. Back east, the first ruler of the centralized Hun state, Rua, passed away, and was succeeded by the nephews Attila and Bleda in 433. The new rulers renegotiated the treaty with the Eastern Romans in 435, receiving promises not to enter into an anti-Hunnic alliance and to provide 700 pounds of gold annually. However, this peace was short-lived. In 439, Carthage was captured by the Vandals. The following year, the Eastern Roman Empire sent an expedition to reclaim Africa. Meanwhile, the Sassanids attacked the Romans in the east, and all that allowed the Huns to raid and pillage the Balkans between 441 and 443, and this time they even reached Constantinople. Emperor Theodosius was forced to agree to pay 6,000 pounds of gold annually. In 445, Bleda died, possibly murdered by Attila, who became the ruler of the Hunnic realm. We don't know why, but in 447, Attila invaded the Eastern Romans yet again. He destroyed the Roman forces at the Battle of the Utus, raided the Balkans, and compelled the Emperor to sign another peace, 
this time promising to leave the Danube region as a buffer. It was around that time the relationship between Attila and Aetius soured. Different sources present different reasons. The Huns were prohibited from serving as mercenaries, which weakened Aetius. At the same time, the Vandals, who had animosity with the Visigoths, and one of the Frankish heirs, invited Attila to invade Gaul to deal with their enemies. The sister of the Western Roman Emperor, Honoria, sent her ring to Attila asking for his help, and he took this as a promise of marriage, and allegedly demanded half of the empire as a dowry. Attila was also displeased that the Huns received no lands within the Roman Empire, unlike other allies. Surprisingly, the war against the Western Roman Empire became inevitable when the Eastern Romans refused to send tribute in 450. Attila needed that income to pay his troops, and as he knew that the Balkans were devastated and had little hope of taking Constantinople, he decided to invade Gaul instead. In the spring of 451, Attila, joined by the Ostrogoths, Gepids, Alemanni and others, crossed the Rhine. At that point, Aetius was in Italy, and as he couldn't rely on his usual Hunnic units, he was forced to enter an alliance with his rival, the king of the Visigoths, Theodoric, ask the Burgundians and Franks for help, and rush to Gaul. We know very little about the route of Attila's troops and which towns were sacked by them, but by early June, his horse-heavy army reached Orléans. The sources are conflicting here. Some claim that Attila besieged the city, and as Aetius arrived in the area soon, he was forced to abandon the siege. Others think that Aetius was near Orléans before the Huns and that he didn't allow Attila to blockade the city. We also don't know if the Alani leader Sangiban was planning to side with the Huns or the Romans, or was waiting to see which side was stronger. In any case, as the area wasn't favourable for cavalry, the Huns retreated, and the Alani joined Aetius, who also received contingents of Visigoths, Franks, Burgundians and Saxons. The Roman general then moved to pursue Attila. The exact location of the battle that we usually call the Battle of the Catalanian Plains is unknown, but some modern historians concluded that it happened at a place called Morica, close to Troyes, some 200 kilometers from Orléans, and not near Chalon, as was previously assumed. Another hotly debated topic is the number of troops, but it is possible that both sides had around 40,000 warriors. The Hunnic army was cavalry heavy, with elite horse archers as its core, while the Romans had more infantry than their opponents. Aetius chased Attila for two weeks. On June 19th, his Frankish vanguard skirmished with Attila's Gepid rearguard. The Gepids soon retreated, as Attila's goal was to bring the Romans to the battlefield of his choosing that was advantageous for his cavalry. Two paths were leading to Morica, divided by a forest, and although the Romans had to split their forces in two to move around this forest, Attila did not attempt to stop them at the choke points, probably rightly, considering his infantry was inferior to that of his enemy. Still, a small cavalry detachment was left on the Montguo Ridge. In the early morning of the 20th of June, the Visigothic column met this detachment on the hill. Attila wasn't planning to defend this position, hoping to fight the Romans on the open field to the east, but he still sent some cavalry reinforcements to the ridge. Both the original unit and the reinforcements slowly retreated, shooting a few volleys. By the afternoon, the Visigoths were in control of the ridge, and although both sides had a good defensible position, they needed a decisive battle so the armies started to deploy. Aetius placed a small cavalry detachment under Theodoric's son Thorismund on the ridge so that the summit would hide them, and formed up his army with his right flank protected by said ridge, and his rear and left by the forests, which gave Attila no opportunity to attack the Romans from the sides or the back. 
Theodoric and the Visigoths held the right wing, and dismounted forming a shield wall with archers in the second line. Alan cavalry took the center, while the left side was held by the Romans, Franks, Burgundians and Saxons, with infantry in the first line in a shield wall, with another group of missile infantry behind them, and cavalry in the rear. Attila and his Huns, or cavalry, formed the opposing center, while the Ostrogoth cavalry led by Valamir manned the left, with other Germanic infantry behind them. On the right, Attila placed the Frank infantry and the Gepid cavalry under Arderic, with more Germanic infantry in the second line. The Hun leader gave a speech in front of his line, and then formed up his horse archers in the centre into a wedge. The Huns then galloped forward, sending volleys into the Alans, who answered similarly, but as the Huns had numerical superiority, Sankiburn's horsemen had to retreat. According to their usual fighting style, the Hun wedge then split down the middle towards the left and the right, sending arrows towards the Romans and the Visigoths, but these volleys were less effective, as they were met with the shield wall. On the contrary, the missile units in the second lines managed to wound and kill many lightly armoured Huns. Still, this attack covered the advance of the Ostrogoths against their Visigoth cousins while the Gepids moved against the Romans. Initially, both shield walls were pushed back, but as the cavalry momentum was lost, the shield walls restored their composure, and the archers in the second line continued to send arrows above the shields. However, the Huns turned towards the center once again and attempted to enter the hole left by the Alan retreat. That threatened the Visigoth shield wall from the flank and the rear, the king of the Visigoths, Theodoric, was killed while trying to encourage his troops, and it seemed that the battle was turning in Attila's favour. Still, Aetius managed to turn some of the Alans back, and ordered them, along with the cavalry reserves, to plug the centre, which stemmed the tide. Feeling that victory was close, Attila's second line of infantry joined the battle. At the same time, Thorismund learned of his father's death, and finally descended from the ridge, charging the enemy's left from the flank and rear. It seems that the Hunnic left was encircled and destroyed. Seeing that his cavalry were bogged down, and his right was making no gains against the Romans, Attila ordered a retreat to the camp. By nightfall, the battle stopped completely. The Huns were seemingly on the back foot, so it is a mystery why Aetius did not attack the next day. Some sources claim that the Visigoths and Franks declined to fight, while others assert that it was Aetius himself who wasn't eager to destroy the Huns, as they were a perfect balance against the Germanic tribes. A later Frankish source maintains that Aetius received a payment from Attila. We will probably never learn the number of casualties, but even if they were heavy, in 452 Attila invaded the Roman Empire yet again, this time via Italy, and sacked Aquileia and Milan, also inadvertently forcing the foundation of Venice. Once again, we don't know why, but according to the sources, he turned back after talking to the Pope Leo. In 453, Attila died, either from an illness or killed by his young wife. Thorismund was murdered by his brother soon after. A year later, Attila's sons were defeated by the Gepids of Arderic at the Battle of Nidau, and that resulted in the collapse of the Hun Empire. In the same year, Aetius was murdered by the Emperor Valentinian, who was in turn killed by Aetius's bodyguards in 455. Just 20 years later, the Western Roman Empire ceased to exist. This video was made possible by our Patreon supporters and YouTube sponsors. Consider joining their ranks in order to support us, learn about our schedule, vote on the next video and much more. We also try to answer every comment, so let us know what you think, we're always happy to talk about history. 
This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.